Yes or no, the Bible is easy to understand. <laughs> it sounded like no was the majority answer there. Uh, maybe yes and no? Okay, yeah, maybe yes and no. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a beautiful conflict, you might say, found in Scripture regarding, well, our understanding of it. On one hand, Scripture is easy to understand. For example, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25, you remember this, Jesus prays, and he prays to the Father, and he says in his prayer, he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you've revealed them to who? To little children. You've revealed them to little children. By implication, if something has been revealed to a little child, well, it must be simple. It must be easy to understand. In another passage, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, John says that we have no need of anyone to teach us. That there's enough that we have in ourselves through the power of the Spirit with Scripture to actually understand without a teacher. Again, we can read and understand the plain meaning of Scripture. And yet, in other places, as you know, scriptures, Scripture suggests that it is hard to understand. For example, even Peter himself says that Scripture is hard to understand. I find it interesting. Peter comments about Paul's writing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. He says there that Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, and then he says, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. I find it very encouraging that Peter himself thought that Paul's writings were hard to understand. Furthermore, while Scripture does tell us that there's no, we have no need of a teacher, Scripture actually refers to teachers quite often. In fact, one of the qualifications of an elder is that he be able to teach Furthermore, Paul writes to Timothy, you remember, he says, command and teach these things until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in these things, he tells Timothy, for by so doing, you will save yourself and your hearers. Interesting there that through the teaching, teaching ministry, there's an opportunity there that someone might be saved. We could save your hearers through the teaching. People get saved when they hear the verbal proclamation of the gospel. So you can see there's this kind of beautiful conflict, this kind of dichotomy or contrast that's found in Scripture regarding its understanding. In other words, as I like to say, two things are true at the same time. Scripture is so clear and so simple that even a child can understand it. And yet... Scripture is so complex and so uh, rich that one can dedicate a lifetime to its study and, as they say, never plumb the depths. I believe this dichotomy is nowhere better displayed than in the Gospel of John, which is quite interesting because we often recommend that new believers read the Gospel of John. It's very interesting and John is tremendously obscure at some points. The language is simple, and I think that's why we want people to read it. We, we see these words, believe, love, truth. We see these kind of words repeatedly in the gospel, light and darkness, sin, judgment, life, glory, bread, and water. And on the surface, these words are simple to understand. But more often than not, John's gospel, as we're reading, we find that there's always a deeper meaning behind these words. There's something else that John wants to teach us. One of the harder sayings of Jesus is found in John chapter 6 in verse 54. Jesus says there, whoever feeds on my flesh, maybe you remember this when we studied it, whoever eats my flesh, Jesus says, and drinks my blood has eternal life. You could remember or you could imagine hearing a man say such a thing. These words are so difficult that John himself says in verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Who could accept such a thing? It was so hard, in fact, that we discover in verse 66 that many of the disciples actually turned back and walked with him no longer. 
They couldn't accept this. Now, the obscurity of Jesus' words, I believe, comes to a head in John chapter 13 through 16. This is the passage we've been studying since the beginning of the year, what's called the Upper Room Discourse. This is the night before the Feast of Passover and the night before Jesus was arrested and crucified. Jesus starts off the evening by washing the disciples' feet. It seems like a simple thing to understand, except Jesus himself actually says while he's washing the disciples' feet, what I am doing, you do not understand now. But he says, afterward, you will understand. There's something else going on here with the foot washing. Shortly after that, you remember, he revealed that one of them is a traitor. Of course, he doesn't tell the group. He only tells one person there, and he signals. Remember, he passed the morsel of bread, and then Judas left. They still didn't know who this traitor was. He then tells them that he'll be leaving, but where he plans to go, they cannot follow him. He speaks about rooms in heaven. I'm going to go to my father's house and, and make a dwelling place for you in heaven. You can imagine, what, are the, what is he saying? What is this about? He tells them that they'll do greater works than he did. We're going to do greater miracles than Jesus? He says that he'll send another helper, another helper, who will dwell, Jesus says, in them. And apparently this helper is going to teach them all things and to bring to their remembrance all that Jesus said. He promises that the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. He shares an extended allegory about a vine. He says, he is the true vine. They are the branches. He tells them that the world will hate them, that they'll experience persecution and suffering. He speaks about this helper that's going to dwell in them, convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He says they'll weep and lament. And then he says, if you ask anything in my name... I'll give it to you. All of these things Jesus says to the disciples in this upper room discourse. I think it's fair to say there's a lot of mystery here. I would be certainly confused about all of this. And this mystery, this ambiguity is the, is the backdrop for the passage that we're going to study this morning. If you have your Bibles open to John chapter 16, look down at verse 25. Again, John 16 and verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Now, when Jesus uses this phrase, figures of speech, I don't think he has any one parable or one allegory or one metaphor in mind. That is to say, I don't think he's specifically talking about, for example, the allegory of the vineyard. Or that he's specifically talking about the illustration of the woman in childbirth, which we studied last week, which is just in a few verses uh, before this. What I believe he's doing here is he's speaking about the obscurity of everything that he said. In other words, there's a sense in which everything Jesus says and has said up to this point has been cryptic to some degree. And yet, as he says there, an hour or a time is coming in which these things will become, he says, plain. They'll become plain. That's the contrast that's offered there in verse 25. Now I speak in figures, he's saying, but an hour is coming when I will speak plainly. Now I speak in figures of speech, then it will be clear. The difference is the hour that's coming. And what is that hour? What is this time that Jesus is speaking about? Well, this is the hour of the cross, This is the the hour of the resurrection. All of these kind of, you might say, eschatological, these end time events that have been prophesied in the Old Testament are all coming to fruition with Jesus. And so the hour is coming, this special, unique time. John himself says it. He records these words from Jesus in John 5 and verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming... And is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. He says in verse 28 of chapter 5, The hour is coming, 
an hour is coming, excuse me, when all who are in the tombs will hear the voice of God and come out. Speaking of the resurrection, obviously. But the cross as well in John 7 and verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because it says his hour had not yet come. Thus, the hour, this phrase or word, hour, is the way that both Jesus and John capture the events associated with the mission of Jesus. And those events include his death, his burial, his resurrection, maybe even his ascension. All of those events that Jesus came associated with his mission. More specifically, and as it relates here to our passage, it's after the resurrection, after the resurrection, that the disciples will truly begin to understand, as it says there, plainly all that Jesus had taught them. If you remember from last week, it was a little while, we talked about that, it was that little while that we explained after having gone to the tomb for three days, that was the little while that Jesus was speaking of. It was after that that he would appear to his disciples, and you remember their sorrow would be turned to joy. And then they would have power in prayer. Those also are results, effects of the resurrection. Now, having said all this, kind of laid the the backdrop of this passage, I want to show you in our text this morning the effects of the resurrection. And I want to show you how these effects proclaim what I'm calling the victory of Christ. Therefore, this morning we'll see how the truth of the resurrection produces four effects that proclaim the victory of Christ. Four effects that proclaim the victory of Christ. Now, if you look again at our text, starting at verse 25, we'll, we'll see the first effect. Verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father, continuing on. In that day, verse 26, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. The first effect is found there in verse 25, and Jesus unpacks it in verses 26 and 27. Here we discover that the resurrection reveals the truth about the Father. The resurrection reveals the truth about the Father. Jesus says when the hour comes, he will speak plainly about the Father. And then he unpacks it in verse 26. He says, in that day, when that hour comes, you will ask in my name... And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Now, this is an obscure verse. It can be difficult to understand. What I think Jesus is saying here is that in that day, the resurrection, there will be a new set of circumstances. And that new circumstance is that God's people will have direct access to God. This is the truth about the Father that is revealed through the resurrection. Apparently, the way Jesus previously mediated the prayers of the saints was to become obsolete. Thinking of, a way to, thinking of a way to illustrate this, and since it's baseball season, I thought I would use a baseball illustration. Jesus speaks as if prayer was like playing catch. The, the disciples threw the ball to Jesus, and then Jesus threw the ball to the Father. It was as if our, the, the glove of the Father was outside of our reach. It's like trying to throw from right field to third base. You just can't make it all the way there. But here, as the effect, as an effect of the resurrection, God has granted us a new position. We have a new position. And from here, well, our prayers can reach the glove of the Father. We can make it all the way to the Father. All we need to do, of course, is to ensure that the name of Jesus is written on the ball. Now, why has God granted us a new position? We'll look at verse 27. For the Father himself loves you. Why? Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. God has granted us this new position because we love Christ and have believed that he came from God. The key words there are obviously love and believe. In other words, the grounds of our new acceptance from the Father is our relationship with Jesus. 
Of course, it's true in one sense that the Father loves all people. We understand that. However, it's also true that the Father has a special love for those who love and believe in His Son. And it's this special love that gives us direct access to the Father. Something to keep in mind here. I think so often we think of a, an angry God, angry God the Father, and a gentle Jesus. We kind of draw this distinction between God, God the Father, and Jesus. Maybe something like good cop, bad cop. Sometimes we see the, the Old Testament as the bad cop and the New Testament as the good cop. I think sometimes we do that in our mind. Or sometimes we think that Jesus came to change the attitude of God. That Jesus came to make God the Father a God of love instead of a God of judgment. But here Jesus isn't speaking that way at all. That's not the point that Jesus is making. He's saying that you can go directly to the Father because it says He loves you. Barclay said, Jesus did not die to change God into love. He died to tell us that God is love. Furthermore, why did God send the Son? Did God send the Son because He so hated the world? No. God sent the Son because He so loved the world. That's why He sent the Son. Barclay again, at the back of everything, there is the love of God. And we could never have known that if Jesus had not told us so. Jesus brought to men the love of God. End quote. Therefore, it's the resurrection that reveals the truth about the Father, namely, that you and I have direct access to God through Christ, and God the Father loves those who love and believe in His Son. Here's a second effect of the resurrection in verse 28. Jesus says there, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Here we see number two, the resurrection validates the truth about Jesus. The resurrection validates the truth about Jesus. These words describe what Morris calls the great movement of, salva of salvation from heaven to earth and back again. The arrival of Christ speaks to his mission, and that mission was almost finished as the disciples gathered in the upper room. Now, what is so important about Jesus, about where Jesus came from? Why is that important? Well, Christ's heavenly origin is important because it reveals the truth about his nature. He is, as they say, very God of very God. He existed in the form of God. And if he came from heaven and existed in the form of God, well then, it stands to reason, he is eternal God. Hallelujah. And being God, he was able to fulfill the righteous demands of the Father. It's necessary that Jesus is God. It's necessary that he came from God. Otherwise, again, he cannot fulfill the righteous demands of the Father. What's so important about where Jesus went? Well, his heavenly destination is also important because it reveals that Jesus did, in fact, fulfill the righteous demands of the Father. His return to the Father is the seal, you might say, on the saving work of the Son. If Jesus doesn't come from heaven, then we've yet to find a person worthy of the Father's righteous demands. If Jesus doesn't return to heaven, then we've, yet to, then we've yet to find a person righteous enough to be accepted by the Father. If this isn't true, then friends, we're still in our sins. We don't have a Savior. But the resurrection proves just the opposite. The resurrection proves... It validates that Jesus is worthy and Jesus is accepted, accepted by the Father. And what does that mean for us? Well, it means we have an advocate. It means we have a mediator. It means we have a forerunner. We have a high priest who suffered the death on our behalf, a substitute who died in our place. We have, in a word, a Savior. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Therefore, the heavenly origin and heavenly destination of Christ validates the truth of Christ, namely, that he is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Now, up to this point in the upper room discourse, it's been a while since we've heard anything from the disciples, at least anything directly. You might say Jesus has been on a holy filibuster. If you've got a red-letter Bible, you can see it's all red. Now, that being said, we did hear something from the disciples in verses 17 and 18, but not really. Really, the disciples were speaking to themselves, and, and Jesus knowing all things, he knew what they were talking about and he responded. But we didn't hear from them directly. We have to reach all the way back to John 14 and verse 22 to hear anything directly from the disciples. In that verse, one of the disciples, Judas, not Iscariot, asked Jesus how it would be, how he would manifest or how he would show himself to them and not to the whole world. It's the last time we heard anything specifically from the disciples and that was just a question. So we're not really sure how or what they're thinking about. But here in John 16, 29, we finally get a sense of what the disciples think about all that Jesus has been saying. Look down at verses 29 and 30. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you, that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why they say, We believe that you came from God. Apparently, the difficulty has been cleared up. It all makes sense now in the mind of the disciples. They're able to connect the dots and to understand what Jesus is speaking speaking about. So they say they have come to know that Jesus knows all things and there's no need to question him about anything else. And so for this reason, they say, we believe that you came from God. They believe in the deity of Christ, that is, as it appears here, they believe he is who he says he is, as we said, very God of very God. Not about you, but I'm not sure what to think exactly about this profession of belief. I want to get behind any profession of belief, but it seems like there's a problem here. And the problem isn't so much with the disciples. The problem is really the place they're at in history, you might say. That is, they're standing just before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Leon Morris says, on the further side of Calvary, no one could know what was involved in Christ leaving the Father and then returning to him. So while the disciples thought the moment of speaking plainly might have come, well, it hadn't. It hadn't come yet. Now, how does this relate to the effects of the resurrection? as our outline has suggested here. Well, here's how. This is the third effect. The resurrection exposes the truth about faith. The resurrection exposes the truth about faith. Notice how Jesus responds in verses 31 and 32. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home, and you will leave me alone, Yet, Jesus says, I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Now, in the ESV translation that I'm reading and we have here in our, at RBC, Jesus offers the question, do you now believe? But the Greek is somewhat ambiguous, and so it might not be a question. It could actually be an exclamation. It could, could have easily be taken as, now you believe. Or I think the NIV has, You believe at last. Again, an exclamation. In some ways, taking the word or the phrase as an exclamation draws out the irony a little bit better. All that we've been through, all that you've seen, and you believe at last is something of what Jesus is getting at, I think. And yet, I don't believe Jesus is expressing doubt necessarily about the reality of the disciples' faith. I do believe that they have faith. He's expressing, however, something about the inadequacy of their faith. While they believe, there's something about the quality of their faith that just appears to be lacking. 
At least it seems to be what Jesus is getting at in verse 32. Again, when he says, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home. The disciples professed faith, but in the immediate future, the faith of disciples would be tested. They would fail the test. They would, as it says there, scatter, which is a prophecy, is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah 13 and verse 7, which says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And while the sheep will be scattered, Jesus says there at the end of verse 32, yet I am not alone. I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And so in the final hours, Jesus would be abandoned by his friends, but he would have the Father's support. God would be with him. What does all this mean for us? Well, as I've said, the resurrection exposes the truth about faith. Before the resurrection, the disciples had a tenuous faith, a fickle faith. They professed belief, but their profession fell to pieces in the face of persecution. But we know how their faith changed after the resurrection. The scattered sheep would turn the world upside down. Their bold profession of faith, they would, they would stand before the, the most brutal rulers of their day, and they would profess Christ with boldness. Their motto was, we must obey God rather than men. Both Scripture and early church, early church tradition teach us that each of these men, each of these disciples, save John, was martyred for their faith, and not in any easy or light way, if that even is a thing. (laughs) Death is still death, I suppose. And yet we know Peter was crucified upside down. We know that Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross, hence the St. Andrew's cross. Philip was tortured and put to death. Why? Well, he led a Roman leader's wife to faith. Matthew was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Judas, the one we call Thaddeus, was executed as a martyr with arrows or killed with a javelin. Nathaniel was either beheaded or flailed alive. Thomas made it all all the way to India, where when the Hindus heard about Jesus, they tortured him, threw him in an oven, and struck him with spears. John's brother James was the first martyr. We read about that in Acts chapter 12. He was killed with a sword by King Herod. Don't forget Stephen. Simon the Zealot was killed in Persia after refusing to offer a sacrifice to a sun god. Matthias, that's the apostle that replaced Judas, you remember him. He was burnt to death. The apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome. Luke, although not an apostle, was hung from an olive tree in Greece in AD 93. Mark, the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark, he was tied with ropes and dragged through the cobblestone streets of Alexandria. That didn't kill him. He spent a night in jail, and then the next day, they did it again until he died. As I said, John was the only one not martyred. That being said, Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us that John was scheduled for boiling in oil but escaped by divine intervention. He was then exiled to Patmos. They couldn't kill him. So they exiled him in Patmos. The emperor Domitian brought John back to Ephesus where he was confined for two years. Then they tried to kill him again by having him drink poison, but he survived that. So it wasn't easy for John. From scattered sheep to this. These are the These are our fathers of faith. (laughs) These are our heroes. Can you see the difference the resurrection makes? (laughs) And that power hasn't expired. The power of the resurrection is alive today. Why else would Paul declare, I have been crucified with Christ? It is... No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. In other words, 
The life of ongoing faith is founded on the resurrection of Christ. We are new. I know you know it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he knows, because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living. Just because he lives, as the song says. I actually don't like that last verse. Sorry. And there's power for the living. That's what it should say. There's power for the living. Why? Because he lives. Not just because he lives. I want to say it stronger. Now, there's something remarkable revealed about Jesus in this passage. Jesus can see through the disciples' overconfidence. He even spoke to their failure to stand with him, and yet he still loved them. He knew they would scatter, and yet he still loved them. Barclay said, he knew that his friends would abandon him, yet at the moment, he didn't unbraid them. And afterward, he did not hold it against them. This is our God. If only we might forgive our brother and overlook an offense, how different would we look? If we could forgive and overlook, the aim of our charge is love. Jesus doesn't love us for what we ought to be or for what we should be. Jesus loves us for who we are. I know it's cliche and I hate saying it, but I'll say it, warts and all. (laughs) Jesus doesn't love the ideal. He loves what's real. Even when what's real is a mess. (laughs) Let me tell you, it is. (laughs) Even further, Jesus speaks to us as he did to the disciples and says, I know when your disloyalty will come. He goes even further. He says, I know when your disloyalty will come. I know when you will scatter and you'll abandon me. I can see it. I prophesied about it over a thousand years ago that it would happen. He says, I know it's coming and it doesn't make any difference to my love. I still love you. How often is God picking up the broken pieces of our lives? And how many times does Scripture say, I will never leave you or forsake you? The fickle faith of the disciples teaches us that God loves us in spite of our broken pieces. Therefore, the resurrection exposes the truth of our faith, namely... That the resurrection empowers a broken faith. It doesn't empower a perfect faith. It empowers a broken faith. It empowers broken people. I told you the truth of the resurrection produces four effects. To review, the resurrection, number one, reveals the truth of the Father. Namely, that we have access to Him through the Son. And that He loves those who believe on His Son. Number two, the resurrection validates the truth about Jesus, namely that he is very God of very God. He came from heaven and he went back to heaven, which means he achieves the righteousness of of the Father. Number three, it exposes the truth about our faith, that our faith is broken and yet God still loves us. Number four, the resurrection uncovers the truth about peace. And covers the truth about peace. Look at verse 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, you have trouble. But take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Here's the purpose of the entire discourse. That we may have peace. Jesus already spoke about this earlier. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The peace that Jesus gives is set in contrast to the tribulation or to the trouble that we face in this world. Jesus says that in him we find peace. Whatever trouble this world brings us, peace will prevail. That is, if we know him. Now, it's interesting that Jesus says, in me you may have peace. He uses a subjunctive there. It seems like it's subject upon something else. 
In me you may have peace. But then he says, in the world you will have trouble. As if the peace he offers to the believers, again, is somewhat undetermined. It's an interesting way of putting it. But I don't think that's the point here. That is that peace is undetermined for the believer. I think Jesus is drawing out the contrast between life in him and life in the world. And the contrast between the, tr- the two is that all must live in the world. We have no choice. All of us are here and all of us have tribulation. All of us have trouble because all of us are in the world. Therefore, or but, I should say, not all will live in him. And that's why he says, may there. Therefore, all will have trouble, but for those who may turn to Christ, you, may, you might say, we will have peace. Keep in mind the word translated there, trouble, is, is not a reference to some mild malady. It's not what the word means. It's talking about something that is a pressing affliction. It's a weighty and real trouble. This reminds us that while the world offers us many pleasures, in the end, it can only deliver pain. The world dazzles and sparkles. It cries out to us. It tries to convince us of its values, to gratify our own desires, to exchange the rule of God for self-rule. That's worldly thinking. And Jesus assures us that while such pursuits might seem to offer some peace, soon enough, we will discover that in the world you will have tribulation. The peace that the world offers is a strong delusion. It's a pseudo-peace. Furthermore, if we lack peace, lack peace, it's not for emotional, psychological, or circumstantial reasons. We lack peace if we lack peace. It's for theological reasons. That's what Jesus is teaching us. In other words, real peace cannot be found by changing our emotions or changing our circumstances. Real peace cannot be medicated, nor can it be achieved by positive thinking. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Real peace can only be received. Do you understand that? It can only be received by Christ. And Jesus unleashes that peace, what I'm arguing, at the resurrection and through the power of the resurrection. And so he says there, take heart, be courageous, for I have overcome the world. What does that mean, I have overcome the world? Well, Jesus is staring his coming death in the face. He's staring it right in the face. And he's declaring his death as a victory. That's the victory. The death of Christ. My death. Which seems totally audacious. And yet that's the point. The cross would seem to represent a total defeat. It would seem that the the world and the devil had gained a victory. But Jesus doesn't see see it that way at all. Jesus declares here that the cross represents the complete victory of the world. That's what the word overcome means. I have conquered. That's the word Nike, by the way. I have conquered the world. And what greater evidence of such a victory than to disarm the world of its greatest super weapon, namely death. Death. Death is the world's greatest superweapon. And there's such a victory in Christ that we have license to mock death. Do you know that? We can mock death. That's what 1 Corinthians says. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? I can mock you. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This means that whatever attack the world might bring, it's simply the last, dish, the last ditch effort of a kingdom whose capital has been sacked. The capital's been taken over. It's been defeated. These are just the minions out here that haven't heard yet. 
that Jesus took the victory. The prince of this world, the devil and his forces have been defeated and the proof was offered on Easter Sunday. It's for this reason that Jesus commands us, take heart, be courageous. His command is especially poignant, I believe, for the disciples in this text. Just a matter of hours, their master would be arrested, beaten, his beard ripped out, spit upon, suffered a horribly traumatic death. Of course, only John witnessed it. They were scattered, fearful in their homes. The world was about to do its worst to Jesus, and yet Jesus would emerge victorious. So it is with us. Take heart. Why? Because Jesus has conquered death, and because we share in his victory. We share in his victory. The world did its best to defeat Jesus, and he emerged victorious. And when the world does its best to defeat, to defeat us, we, friends, can emerge victorious. We can possess the courage and the conquest of the cross. Therefore, the truth of the resurrection produces four effects that proclaim the victory of Christ. The resurrection reveals the truth of the Father, it validates the truth about Jesus. It exposes the truth about our faith. And it uncovers the truth about peace. And when these four come together, we can see, we can hear, we can feel the proclamation of victory. I hope you can see it. It's so important to remind ourselves of such things, is it not? I want to close with a quote from J.C. Ryle. He says, quote, Let us lean back our souls on these comfortable words and take courage. The storms of trial and persecution may sometimes beat heavily on us, but let them only drive us closer to Christ. The sorrows and losses and crosses and disappointments of our life may often make us feel sorely cast down, but let them only make us Tighten our hold on Christ. Armed with this very promise, let us under every cross come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us often say to our souls, why are you cast down and why are you disquieted? And let us often say to our gracious master, Lord, did you not say be of good cheer? Lord, do as you have said and cheer us to the end. Amen.